Well, one great thing, when you practice yoga, really practice it, you know it, heat doesn't bother you at all. So for that one reason, we should practice yoga, shouldn't we? Well, the subject tonight is yoga. Yoga explains. We've been discussing this for quite some Thursday evening. And you'd think perhaps we'd get sick of discussing it. But we cannot afford to get sick of it, so to speak, until every one of us is saved. That's how important yoga is. Yoga means union with the Infinite Father until every one of us Yes, everyone in this room rises about this outward consciousness of delusion and knows the one eternal Father, we should not dis stop discussing yoga. Because the real value of yoga is that it gives us oneness with God. There are different aspects of yoga pertaining to the body and other things. Those are necessary, but yoga of salvation is the greatest thing because unless we save our souls of what good is a healthy body through the practice of yoga even. But if you utilize the highest form of yoga, yoga of salvation, to attain that salvation, then you are really studying and using yoga. Yoga, remember, means union. Union of your soul with the one father. Why do we feel separated from him? Why do we feel apart from him? We, his children. Did you ever stop to think of that? We don't feel apart from our children on this earth, but somehow we feel apart from the only real relative we have, which is God himself. And so it is wise to study yoga. Last time we talked about freeing the soul from attachment. The reason why we feel separated from God and our Father is that our souls are attached to this duality of consciousness, this outward living, this worldly and mundane existence. That's why we feel apart from God. And so last time, we discussed that. Free the soul from attachment. And then when those attachments have been removed and the barriers have been removed and the walls have been torn down, there you are one with your father, free in his omnipresence, in his love. As it says in the psalm, if you are humble, if you are pure in heart, if you are without guile, if you become like little children, you will know the kingdom of heaven. And in the psalms it says, he will beautify the meek with salvation. It's very simple. We must be humble. We must do away with the ego somehow, because the ego is the subject to all consciousness apart from God. So we must do away with the ego. Substitute the soul's intuition for the power of the ego, which is far superior to ego's limited power. And so, you remember Jesus said in John, here comes Nathaniel. I often quote it because I never get tired of quoting it because it's so true. Here comes Nathaniel, who is without guile. And because he is without guile, he shall see angels ascending and descending from heaven. In other words, because he is without guile, because he has done away with ego consciousness, then the soul's intuition can flow through him and he can see the kingdom of heaven with its different forces and he can feel his nearness to God and finally oneness with him. And so, how to be me, how to be without guile in this world which seems so far apart from those things? How? By yoga. Why yoga? If you practice your yoga and supersede this worldly consciousness and feel intuition of the soul, the ego cannot remain. And if the ego has been done away with, there is no guile left, nothing but meekness and humbleness, and your heart will be pure. Because 
when you do away with the ego, then the soul's power, being a ray of the infinite Father, can flow through you and change you and make you over. You cannot do it yourself. But God, quiet, gentle, humble love can change us all. Yoga will give you that because it will make you or put you in such a position that God's love can flow through you. Only by union with your soul's power can you, through the intuition of your soul, realize that you are not this body, but that you are something far greater, something that is not tangible like this body, passes away, something eternal. You can know this through the right practice of yoga, not just the yoga that makes our bodies fit, of course that's a part of it, and our minds sharp, but the yoga that gives us salvation, freedom, and attachment to this ego consciousness. That's what we should use yoga for. Now, about the soul. Tonight we'll take up a little more about the soul, which seems to be sort of an elusive fellow at times. The ego's right on the job, giving us lots of trouble. But the soul far greater than the ego. It is the ego, but unattached. And so a few rules to remember. That is, in the performance of soul-freeing yoga, are these. To think. Remember, remember, things of truth are usually simple. To think is to be identified with what? You all know. The ego, not to think, nor be unconscious, is to be identified with the soul. Well, you say, if I don't think, where am I? What am I? You'll be all right. Try and stop thinking and see how much you'd like to stop thinking. These are facts. Every night in sleep, you stop thinking, at least some of the time. Sometimes the dreams bother us. But, to be without thought is to be in the realm of the soul, provided that you do not go into unconsciousness. Now, yoga will give you that state of thoughtlessness, so to speak, or the state of consciousness whereby you can be without thought. But, if you go into unconsciousness, what, of what use is it? Therefore, yoga will give you that state of consciousness if you practice it. Especially yoga that comes from one who had that state of consciousness, the oneness with God, Yoga will give you that, whereby you can be above thought, and yet not unconscious, and be fully conscious of your soul. Many in this room do it. In meditation, those who really meditate, which means consciously contacting God, or concentrating on God. Those who, of you who do that are in the state of soul consciousness. You're not unconscious, and yet you're above thought. And so realize, that when you're in the realm of thought, you are not in soul consciousness, but in the realm of ego. Now, you should be able, at will, to stop that. At will, it's difficult, but it can be done. Stop the thought, and then, without falling asleep or going into unconsciousness, feel the intuition of God's presence within you as your soul. Yoga will do that. If it is practice, and if you do not Tire or give up too soon? Everybody can do it because we all are children of God. So that's an important thing to remember. Is yes. my other paper go? This seems to be a funny evening, isn't it? Thank you, Ron. That's because I wasn't thinking. So you see, sometimes not to think isn't good. But usually, if I could stop those thoughts, I'd give anything at times. And I know many of you will say that. Because they prevent us from feeling the presence of God within. So, not to think nor become unconscious is to be merged in soul consciousness. Now, introspect your meditation. Introspect it. Don't be afraid of it. Introspect it and find out just where you are. Can you 
rise above thought. Of course, you cannot write off, but at will, after a reasonable length of time, can you still away the thought? If you can, you will begin to feel that stillness of God's presence. And from then on, it's just a matter of perseverance or the use of your will or deep prayer that the grace of God descend upon you. Only by the grace of God can we see his face. Only by the grace of God can we know him fully. But we can strive and strive and strive and keep on striving. That's our duty. But know him, to feel his love, means we must receive the glance of his grace. Because God is the sole doer. He's the one that will give it to you. You cannot get it by your own power. You cannot get it by mind and reason. God is not known by reason, no more than he is known by thought. But as we'll come to later, he is easily, easily discerned or felt through affection and love. Now, you cannot love God with a racing mind. You cannot love God with a racing mind. Any of you who've been in love, which is nothing to be ashamed of, you'll find that at that time when you really felt for whomever it was, there were no thoughts in your consciousness, just one intense feeling for that person or for God or for Master. That's the key. We have to be able at will to steal the waves of the mind that the intuition of our souls flow and give us that contact with God which is our birthright. And so these are important, just one or two important things to remember. Find out just where you are. If you know where you are and the thoughts are bothering you, try harder, try harder, pray to God deeper, and like a thief in the night, sometime he will come and flow over you. And then you'll be real happy but then you will know, and no one can take it away from you. Therefore, knowledge of our soul can be inferred from the fact that a person existing without thought, nor not being unconscious, is in some state of consciousness. And when you see a person like that, is without thought, but not unconscious, you must infer that he is in the state of soul consciousness. Now in deep sleep, or in sleep, we are in that state of consciousness, but we're unconscious. So when you see a person above the ego consciousness, not, not asleep, then you must know he is in soul consciousness. In sleep we are in soul consciousness, but we're unconscious, so to speak, of it. We have not made the soul consciousness dynamic to our ordinary waking consciousness that we call it. And so when you see someone like that, investigate that state. If you find yourself that way, that's what this is for. Investigate that state of consciousness just when the thought speaks. In your meditation. Just when the thought speaks. And don't go into unconsciousness. Or don't daydream. Investigate that. That's your soul consciousness. You have to make it dynamic to your being, so to speak. And everyone can who will. Because everyone has the presence of God implanted in their soul and in their consciousness, in their being. And so, knowledge of being one with, this is very important now, Knowledge of being one with the consciousness that remains after the ego is non-existent. And you'll know that because the ego is the subject of your thought. That's the state of consciousness which we must know about. And that's why you meditate. Those who meditate correctly and deeply is to know that state of consciousness that is with us when the ego is non-existent. And you'll know that when you at will can still the thought and you will also know it as soul consciousness by the bliss which you feel. Because that's an attribute of God's presence within you. As you investigate that state of consciousness above ego consciousness, you may see 
at the Christ center, you may see the spiritual light. That's very helpful, very soothing. You may hear the cosmic sound of Om, which is very helpful. If you emerge in it, you'll feel the intelligence of God in it. But perhaps greatest of all is to feel in the stillness within, just like a thief in the night coming over you, God's love. That's the greatest thing. You will know it as the bliss that you feel. For our master said, this consciousness is God conscious. That's why we must investigate through yoga this state of consciousness after the ego has been eliminated, so to speak, or ceases to exist. That's why this state of consciousness is so regenerating, rejuvenating, and so calming, because it is the presence of God. And if we attain it in a conscious way, we have all his power, all his beauty, all his love, all things pertaining to him are ours. I say ye are God, all of you, children of the Most High. So these things are true. And right yoga, or self-realization fellowship yoga, will give you that if you persevere and stick to it. And so, as we find this state of consciousness, when the ego is non-existent, and know it, then we are practicing conscious sleep. That's all. In deep sleep, you read the scriptures, and you'll find many of the saints had visions. I was in the state of deep sleep. I have read several places. In other words, we have to make that state of deep sleep dynamic to our consciousness. We have to consciously be, not go into oblivion. It's, it's, it's rather nice when you're tired, but it could be much greater and nicer if you could hold your consciousness through the state and know that you and your father are one. That's why it's so much better than just ordinary sleep. Now, yoga helps you to utilize the soul's power of intuition. Why? Because, why should you do it? Because God cannot be known through the senses, mind, or intellect. Through reason, you cannot know God. You cannot attain his presence within you. But by love, yes. And so yoga is very important because it helps us to still those faculties within us which are utilized when we use reason as the sensation, thought, and intellect. But God is not known through that. Otherwise, how could the meek, the pure in heart, the humble, the children know God? And so these are very important things. Remember that yoga will help you rise above those faculties which keep us from knowing God, prevent us from knowing Him, senses, mind, and intellect. Of course, we have to use those things in ordinary living, Otherwise, we'll starve. We all know that. But unless we find God, we'll not only starve, we'll die. Because part of ourselves is spiritual and has to be fed with spiritual food. And that spiritual food is God's love. So this is important. Because yoga will help you to utilize the soul's power whereby you can know God. And what is the soul's power? Intuition. What is intuition? Love. God is love. God created universe upon universe through the love in his heart. And that love he has left in us, naturally implanted in our heart. But until we unite that love of our heart with him, we will not know him. Because that's the one thing he doesn't have, is that love which is left with us. And he wants that, but having given us free will, we have to give it to him, no matter how much he wants it. He cannot take it unless we want to give it to him, although he wants it more than anything else, because that's the only thing he hasn't got. He's got a billion suns and universes but that love in our heart he has given to us, plus the freedom to accept him or reject him. Yoga will place us in the right 
position, consciously, whereby we can accept and receive the grace of our infinite Father. And so, in conclusion, remember a soul consciousness springs in us just when we have risen above these nuisance-making, so to speak, thoughts and senses. When we've risen above that state, then the intuition is right there. And so what do we have to do? We have to cultivate that state just about ego consciousness. When the thoughts have gone to rest, Master says, that's the time I see him best. That's the time we feel the presence of God. We have to cultivate that state of consciousness, not fall into oblivion by sleeping or daydreaming, but through our will, and especially love for the One Father, make that dynamic to our consciousness. That's why yoga is so important. That's what the saints do. They do this. They learn by their spiritual discipline to subdue the thought, and then by the utilization of their will to unite their soul with the presence of God. That's why God sends them every once in a while, like he has sent our master, so as to give us, give us inspiration to keep on. Those who do find what they're at. On this will be instant. Now I have <clears throat> a few references here I'd like to give you at this time. From Hindu philosophy, most of it you can find in the Master's autobiography, or other books on Hindu philosophy, or our Master's other books which he has written. These things are taken from them. And so, yoga of meditation, yoga of meditation does not begin until one is above thought. You say, oh, I meditate. Oh, I meditate two hours a day regularly. All right, introspect and see if you are without thought for those two hours and that you feel the bliss of God. And so remember, meditation means concentration on God. And you cannot concentrate on God while you're in the realm of thought. God is what? God is the great cosmic vibration, the sound of Om, the Amen, the Amen of the Mohammedans, the home of the Tibetans, and the Hunavar of the Zoroastrians. Because in that holy vibration is God's love, plus his omnipresence, plus his wisdom, his great light. All things are in there. Therefore, meditation means concentration on God's presence with you, within you as a definite something, not an idea. A definite force which at will you can contact. That's why it is important to practice yoga, because yoga will give you that vantage point whereby you can contact the presence of God within. And this is from uh, Hindu philosophy. The Vedas say, he who knows Om <clears throat> knows God. He who knows on that doesn't mean just to hear it once in a while, but to hear it and merge in it. That's the presence of God. Also, those who are considered the greatest of thinkers can only consider about God. Think of it. You may have the sharpest intellect. You may be advanced in reasoning and inference and all that goes with this. But you can only infer or reason about God, about his attributes. But when through the practice of yoga, you steal the mind and its attributes and its powers, and through the intuition of your soul feel the love of God, then you can taste and touch and feel the presence of God, like we sang in our chant. The Temple of Silence. I will meet thee, I will touch thee. You think thinking about an idea of God is something great? That's no good. That will not satisfy us. I will taste thee, I will touch thee, and I will love thee. Can you love an idea? Well, I guess some people can, but there's not much satisfaction in it. But when you feel the presence of God as a definite force, the force of love, then you can truly love him, as the chant said. 
And so from Hindu philosophy, we get these things which point out to us the truth which we must realize that God is tangible. Our souls are tangible. The consciousness of the soul is tangible and can be known through the practice of yoga. Now from the Bhagavad Gita, we have one reference in the second discourse, the 30th line. This has to do with soul consciousness. We think, sometimes we feel this body is real. It's almost impossible not to think that. But when you supersede it through the practice of yoga, you will know it is not the reality. And so in the Gita we read, the second discourse, the 30th line, this dweller in the body of everyone <coughs> is invulnerable. O Bharata, therefore thou shouldest not grieve for any creature. That means we should not be attached to this outward living wherein we see paradoxes and injustice because the soul underneath does not perish, always was and always will be. And then from the Bible, one or two references as to how soul consciousness comes. First from Revelation, Revelation of the 14th chapter, Fifth verse, as follows. Those who will receive soul consciousness, as Jesus said, here comes the sandal who is without guile. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. If there's any other consciousness within us, any other desire, we cannot reach God. Because desires in the heart, or the dross in the heart, prevents the spiritual eye from opening. The Master used to say the heart must be pure gold. There's only one desire that I know of you can have, and that is that you receive the grace of God somehow. No other desire. And if you can do that, and the heart is pure gold, then you will see him face to face. And also from Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, second verse. And this speaks how suddenly the presence of God will come, when you least expect it. But you have to watch and pray to be ready to catch it when it comes. Because it is so subtle. You see, it's far above waking consciousness, far above thoughts and intellect and reason. It is far above that. And it comes only when there's one desire in the heart that's for God. And so here we read, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Just subtly when you think, oh, what's the use, I'm getting nowhere. Then he comes. Like a thief in the night. Because that's the state of consciousness you have to reach. You want nothing else. You've had plenty of other things. You don't want anything but him. And then, like a thief in the night, he steals over us. These references from our Bible. And finally, the last reference, which I hope you'll like, has to do with humbleness. It is from Guru Nanak, one of the great saints of India, which Master used to, writings of which Master used to quote and speak about. And he has written this lesson in humbleness and humility and guilelessness. If you will listen carefully, you will speak how important his words are. And how, as all the great saints, he also agrees on one thing, God alone. God is the doer. Jesus said it in this way, can you change your statue one cubit? No, because God is the doer. And so Nanak says, man hath no strength to live, nor any to die. 
You cannot live, I cannot live, except the power of God in us. And we even cannot die unless God withdraws that life force from us. Nor hath he strength to reign or to amass what cause mind's disturbance. You know how the mind disturbs it. Then he says, man hath no strength of meditation, spiritual knowledge, or correct reasoning. Nor hath he strength for adoption of the means by which he would be free of the world's meshes. It has to be by the grace of God. And then the last part is the most wonderful. He in whose hand lieth the strength doeth it all. and surveyeth his dispensation all by himself. There's one God, you shall have no other gods but me. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. It is he, that power of light and love in each and every one of us, that is the only reality. Therefore he is the, the sole doer. But this not excess. I read once more, he in whose hand lieth the strength, doeth it all and surveyeth his dispensation all by himself. No one is therefore high or low, saith Nanak. No one in the presence of God is greater than another. That's the greatest thing. That's why Jesus on the cross said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he said, Thy will be done. And if we can reach that state of consciousness where we have full trust in God and can honestly say and feel it, Father, thy will be done. Then our troubles cease. And God's love sustains and sustains us fully and completely. Next time we'll go up, go on a little bit more.